This lecture in Western Peace Traditions will be the final one in the course in which I just want to return to the three metaphors of the hawk, the owl, and the dove. The hawk, as I've mentioned in previous lectures, is the one approach to peace, peace through strength, Pax Romana, Pax Americana, is that he or she who has the greatest power, the greatest strength, if they do not exercise it in uh, a realistic manner, then they themselves will become the victims of other people's understanding of power. And so there's a whole understanding within the history of war and peace, which great novel, of course, is Lev Tolstoy's, is when Napoleon invades Russia in 1812. Here you have what seemed to be the greatest army at its time uh, invading Russia. And so how were the Russians to respond to a very aggressive form of military might? And this whole thinking is unpacked in very subtle and insightful ways in the great epic of Tolstoy war and peace itself. But Napoleon's understanding is no different than elements you'll find in world history of expansionistic empires. You can get that in, it's certainly unfolding in China today. You get with the dimming of the American empire. Uh, you can see it's many CIA uh, covert, overt operations in terms of exercising its power in the Middle East and in Africa and Central Latin America. Um, USSR in its period of glory or its golden age again throughout not only uh, various states in Russia, Eastern Europe, Africa, other parts of the world. But again it's the hawk and you find it in many expansionistic empires that if one does not exercise power then you'll be the victim of other people who have the power. And so significant elements of Machiavellian thinking and Hobbes' thinking and others, which is then spelled out in terms of political realism in its various forms and guises, is that he or she who has the power is the one who then can bring peace, but it's peace through power rather than peace through nonviolent resistance or justice or any of these ideals which are seen more as on the center or the center left. And so the hawk in that sense embodies at the political level a notion that life is about power and of course significant elements of late modern and postmodern thought very much reflect and embody this understanding that power is at the center of interpersonal relations, uh, it's at the center of community relations, it's at the center of larger national relations and international relations itself. And so peace and power then for the hawk, they're like the two hands, the two legs, the two eyes of interpreting how politics should be done in an understanding of peace. Now the flip side or the other side of that, as has been mentioned in a variety of lectures, is the dove. The dove is very concerned, not necessarily not concerned about power, but arguing that more significant than power is peacemaking in a just manner. And where just peace interferes with power, then the just peacemaker must challenge power, not in a violent way, not in an aggressive way, but in a non-violent manner. That can be through various acts of pro protest, civil disobedience. You can see this, of course, played out. I mentioned earlier, Lev Tolstoy's War and Peace. His, there, they said there were two people in Russia in his time, the Tsar and Tolstoy. And Tolstoy's, all of his writings drawing from the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and various other peacemaking documents believe that power in and of itself without justice uh, led to injustice and there would be terrible repression of people
and human rights violations. And Tolstoy's vision is the young Mahatma Gandhi was emerging initially in South Africa with the apartheid and the colored issues. He contacted Lev Tolstoy. Tolstoy was nearing the end of his life in 1910. Mahatma Gandhi contacted him and out of that the inspiration of Lev Tolstoy then had a huge impact on Gandhi forming the Tolstoy community in South Africa in which his early lessons of non-violent resistance, dovish resistance in that context were embodied that he then transferred when he left South Africa to India and the whole decolonization movement. The point to note with both Tolstoy and Gandhi, which is important, they were living in political contexts or structures which allowed them to nonviolently protest against injustice, whether it's the peasants in Russia uh, who are terribly treated in terms of living conditions, working conditions, pay conditions, and in South Africa, a political system existed, albeit flawed in application, at least in principle, it allowed for protests to continue. And so with Gandhi, and then in India, which of course its roots, historically a British colonial, had a political system in theory in place and through the courts that allowed this sort of protest without a person disappearing which didn't mean there was not violence in terms of Tolstoy's. Many of the Tolstoyans certainly felt the firm arm of the Tsarist regime, as did many of the Gandhians in South Africa, and certainly the violence of the worst elements of the British in India. But in principle, Gandhi as a lawyer could appeal to certain legal standards, political structures, which the British had to uh, honestly acknowledge were part of what they had tried to put in place in India. So the dovish tradition on the other hand that we see not only in Tolstoy and Gandhi but certainly in your, your multiple readings say in North America, the, the Berrigans, Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day, there are many others, uh, Latin American protests, uh, Many people who win the Nobel Prize, the Peace Prize, either the formal Peace Prize or the alternate Peace Prize, are women and men who are engaged in non-violent opposition to injustices. They're trying to be peacemakers, ecological issues. Uh, they try and bring into being uh, a, a just, peaceful, and ecologically meaningful world through non-violent protests. Usually people like that are working within the context of a political system, at least in theory, that allows for protest, that allows for opposition, and people like that will be imprisoned, but you often don't get death squads coming to the door, or disappearances. My years when I was with Amnesty International, we often had to deal with states which didn't have those structures, didn't, and even if they did, the application of them was totally inconsistent with actually the political charters they held or the legal structures they held that were meant to protect people. Uh, from military or unions of state and military and the way they treated opposition, whether Central Latin America, Russia, China, many other places, Middle East, of course, Africa. And so the, the dilemma of those who are peacemakers who do not want to slip into the hawkish cage or trap and those who, on the other hand, are doves in both crude and subtle forms of pacifism or nonviolent resistance or using the law to serve your ends within a system that at least acknowledges that's a possibility. Um, these become often the two extremes and, of course, a certain type of dovish tradition put in a hawkish context, these people disappear very, very quickly and so whether in the Middle East or Latin America under certain conditions, Nazi Germany, uh, Franco's Italy, what we see happening in China today, any you know 
Dalai Lama has to flee to North Northern India, the Hong Kong resistance, the treatment of various Christians and Muslim groups, particularly it's caught the news recently, certainly one of the Muslim communities in China, arguing in fact it's a form of ethnocide going on uh, with, within China. And so if a person comes from a strong hawkish nationalist tradition, a certain form of peacemaking, um, these peacemakers, people are put on the crosses essentially, and this is essentially Jesus' fate too, and he confronts the hawkish nature of the Roman imperial ten ten tendency. And the middle way then is the owl. How does the owl find their way in a tradition in which you've got the hawks on one hand, which is opposed, on the other hand, the doves who think that nonviolent resistance is the only way, not that it is not a significant way, but what happens when the dovish way is pushed to its limits and by continuing down that path, in fact, uh, you facilitate greater injustice because by the protests, the hawks come along and just scoop people like this up and they disappear. And so what time, at what point does the dovish position become a naive form of idealism encountering an aggressive form of realism that then plays into its hands and then even more injustice occurs, particularly the doves themselves who are then put in cages and often killed. So the owl tradition finds a middle way between acknowledge in, in that sense often owls are fellow travelers with doves work very closely with them but under what conditions does the dovish perspective is it inadequate in certain political contexts because once we get out of the hothouse world of liberal democratic affluent first world and we enter politically other elements of the world where that form of resistance, that form of opposition is met very clearly with death squads, imprisonment, journalists are killed uh, very quickly and nobody's responsible in terms of uh, really bringing down states that engage in this sort of behavior for they're the ones in power. And so the owl in that sense lives in a much more a difficult situation. So for example, how did a Boris Pasternak, probably one of the great Russian writers of the 20th century, make sense of his situation, both literarily and political? How did Erasmus in the 16th century make sense of the owl's position in that context? Uh, and so many situations of women and men within hawkish contexts how do they find their owlish way in continuing to present a perspective of peace, just peace, I might add? Um, how do the Palestinians in the Israeli context make sense of their perspective in challenging uh, Zionist treatment of the Palestinians in West Bank and even worse in Gaza? Um, and so what do protesters in Saudi Arabia, what do they face? Or I mentioned earlier China, which can come down brutally and quickly on people. Um, most people will probably remember 1989 at Tiananmen Square. We had our annual Amnesty International Conference at UBC that year. I still remember, and I think most people would, of the person standing in front of the tank. Uh, here's a form of a metaphor of nonviolent resistance to immense political power. What happened to that person? Well, that's a story. So the owl, the owl finds the middle way. So in A Course in Peacemaking, these three metaphors, when applied to particular historic and contemporary political situations, and when we think of peacemaking, I mean, we can reduce it to a micro level, peace within ourselves. What does that look like, finding integration? What does it look like at a micro level between people, between communities, in fairly benign political... There's going to obviously be conflict. Con life is shot through with conflict, with agon, with struggle. But some struggles and conflicts are engaged in 
they can be painful, they can lead to sad consequences, but they're not, you're not dealing with death squads and you're not dealing with military coming in and being imprisoned and tortured and solitary confinement. It's, but conflict remains. The context of the conflict will determine how some form of conflict resolution, mediation can be worked out. But in a class in political science, not only you know, say in sociology or conflict resolution, but in political science, it's essential that one looks at the larger political realities and contexts for peacemakers when there's an unjust ruling system and when is the dove appropriate to deal with the hawk? When is the owl appropriate to deal with the hawk? When must the owl raise kindly questions about the dovish approach to handling violence. And so these three metaphors, these three metaphors take us into the larger political questions of peace making, peace keeping, what it means to be a dove, what it means to be an owl, and what it means to be a hawk. And in a course in politics and peace, these become three portals into reflecting on these particular questions.